All right, great. So um, we'll get started here. Thank you everybody for joining us um, this Friday afternoon. Um, I am Dr. Brian Berman. I'm the uh, chair of the Division of Movement Disorders at VCU Health and director of the VCU Parkinson's and Movement Disorder Center. Uh, really appreciate you joining us for this webinar. This is entitled Technology Advances in Parkinson's Disease. And we will be recording this uh, webinar. So if you miss anything and want to go back and watch it again, or want to share it with your family, friends, and the like, uh, you'll be able to do that. We'll be sending out a, a link in the coming days uh, to take you to the video. Uh, so today I'm joined by friends and partners uh, here from Power Over Parkinson's, Gary Rogliano and Margaret Preston. And uh, they're gonna be helping moderate today's webinar. Um, together, uh, we are really pleased to present this webinar. It's the second uh, in our series, and its uh, you know, purpose is to try to keep our community of, um, informed about Parkinson's, what's going on, and also help keep people connected. Today, uh, we are thrilled to bring a team of experts uh, from the Parkinson's and Movement Disorder Center, VCU Health, and they're going to be uh, talking about some really uh, cool things. So some latest technologies in terms of Parkinson's and uh, including some robotic assistance and gait training, eye tracking tools for diagnosis, vibration therapy, and virtual reality. So pretty exciting uh, webinar coming up. Glad you're able to join us. Uh, so before um, hearing from our panelists, uh, I would like to take a moment to introduce the co-moderators here uh, from Power Over Parkinson's. So uh, Gary Rogliano, who is the founder and chairman of Power Over Parkinson's and Margaret Preston, who is uh, the current president of uh, Power Over Parkinson's. They will be um, joining us here, uh, mod helping moderate. And uh, really the, um, the group also known as POP uh, has just been um, a great uh, strategic partner with VCU since uh, 2019, just before I arrived. Uh, and really, um, their amazing uh, philanthropic support has uh, really allowed us to, to reach more uh, people with Parkinson's and, and really um, try to help improve their lives through wellness and exercise programs, socialization activities, peer-to-peer uh, -peer support ground, programs and the like. And perhaps Gary and Margaret, uh, if you don't mind, would we take a moment and describe a little bit about uh, the mission of POP and some of your offerings for patients. All right, thanks very much for that kind invitation. I certainly appreciate it. Um, about three years ago, I was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. At that time, I knew little or nothing, absolutely nothing about disease whatsoever. And as most of you on this call do realize, or probably all of you on this call realize, that it is a full-time job to manage the Parkinson's symptoms. As such, I wanted to learn a lot more about it. So I started attending a lot of the exercise classes, some of the support group lunches and meetings and conferences to learn as much as I can about it to learn to help myself. But in doing so, I learned a lot about the people with Parkinson. There was a common theme throughout. Nobody was really focused on um, improving the current quality of life of the people with Parkinson and their care partners. There was no focus on that where, where you look at physical activity, exercise, and socialization. So that gave me a genesis of an idea which led to forming POP, which then is totally focused in bringing to the bringing to people with Parkinson's and their care partners, both um, physical activity, exercise, and socialization. That's what we're dedicated to. Let me turn it over to Margaret to give you a little bit more detail about us. Thank you. Yeah, so after we established our mission at Power Over Parkinson's, um, we've executed on it in several ways. Uh, first and foremost, we started a strategic partnership with VCU Health by funding a research chair and endowed chair to study the various types of um, exercises and the impacts they have on those with Parkinson's disease. So um, that was a pivotal point in our um, startup as we established that really important relationship. And subsequently, we created the Parkinson's Activity League. Um, for those of you who are listening, you may have um, attended one of these events where we partnered with local businesses to offer free uh, mornings of activity to those with Parkinson's and their care partners. 
Um, those have looked a little bit differently as we've navigated these times, but we hope to get uh, more PAL events on the calendar regularly this year. Um, we've also conducted various fundraising events in terms of um, holding golf tournaments, uh, sock hop dance parties. So we definitely have that fundraising arm so we can provide these free programs to people with Parkinson's. Um, and then finally, we've adapted as everyone has um, through these times by offering programs such as the Parkinson's Advisors Group, um, where people with Parkinson's who uh, have the disease are offering their time and support to those who are new, newly diagnosed or those who just simply need some support. Um, we've also conducted the POP Profile Series, where we've interviewed wonderful people who have the disease and also just healthcare professionals to offer their perspective um, and their insight uh, to keep the community connected during these times. And finally, we also conduct weekly workout videos via Zoom, um, Zoom calls rather, uh, every week for those with Parkinson's. So uh, we've executed it as best we can over the last year and hope to continue to see more of you um, in person this year, so. Thank you. Yeah, you're, you're doing so much, uh, having a, a huge impact on the community around the country. Really incredible. And one of the reasons why I wanted to come out here and join VCU. Um, so it's been a little bit over 200 years, actually, since James Parkinson described um, some individuals that would later be termed as having Parkinson's disease. Um, and even after 200 years, we're, we're good at making the diagnosis, but uh, we still have room to improve especially early on in the uh, disease course. And um, you know, levodopa came around about 60 years ago uh, and really revolutionized treatment, but then we realized we still have issues um, that, with motor symptoms that don't respond to levodopa and some of those like loss of balance or trouble with walking. And so we need you know, new ways to, to help treat these other symptoms. And today is an exciting uh, discussion of through these next generation therapies that uh, they're being used to sort of help with diagnosis of Parkinson's as well as to treat some of these difficult um, to improve symptoms. And uh, VCU Health has been leading the way in a lot of these um, uh, projects and research and uh, are dedicated to providing these group treatments to patients. And so uh, with that, I wanna go ahead and introduce some of our panelists, uh, our panelists who will be talking today. So we're going to be uh, first off having Dr. Mark Barron, who's a professor of neurology um, here at VCU Health. Uh, he'll be followed by Bobby Hand, who's our uh, Movement Disorders Program Coordinator at the VCU Parkinson's Movement Disorders Center. Uh, we'll be talking next, followed by Dr. Ingrid Professor Aboff, who uh, also has an appointment with the uh, Department of Neurology here at VCU Health. And, um, and that'll be, and then lastly will be Dr. Alexander Stamenkovich, uh, who is a postdoctor fellow here at the VCU in the Department of Physical Therapy. And so each of these speakers is going to share with you an update uh, in their area of expertise. And, uh, and we will answer some of the questions that were submitted during the registration process um, for the today's events. We welcome you though to also go ahead and if you would like to ask questions uh, anonymously that you can use the Q&A feature at the bottom uh, of the screen of your Zoom and uh, enter in your questions in there and we'll try to get uh, to as many as we can at, at the end. Bobby is going to show us, I guess, a, a live demonstration of the Kyogo exoskeleton in use and then we'll afterwards learn a little bit more about that. Good morning or good afternoon. We're in that weird middle phase right now. So uh, my name is Bobby Han. I'm a physical therapist here at VCU. And I'll skip to the gentleman in the background after he does the lap. But Dr. Barron was going to introduce a bit about one of our newer technologies, the Kyogo dermoskeleton or exoskeleton. So it's a robotic assist gait trainer that we are uh, performing some groundbreaking research in the use of robotics and movement disorder. So we actually just finished up a visit with this individual, a longtime patient and friend of mine. Uh, he is uh, previously diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, but there's been an update to progressive supranuclear palsy. Um, so a, a Parkinson's lookalike, but many of these devices that we're trying to study do apply to these different Parkinsonisms. 
And my friend Bobby here has some challenges with freezing of gait. And these have led to some falls and, and some issues with safety. However, when he walks in this device and then goes home, both he and his wife report that he's moving much better throughout the day. So there are some freezes that occur while we're training, but we're seeing some lasting effect and that's really exciting. So again, we're in the fledgling stages of this research, but as he comes by, I'm gonna get out of the way here and just talk a little bit. But if I do a little scratch, you can see he's wearing a device from the hip down. And we just walk for about 10 seconds. And this is his next phase. He wants to relax a little bit. And we want to move through that. So we're hopeful that training with this sort of device might open up avenues for people to one day purchase them for in-home use and be supported by insurance. But for now, VCU is kind of leading the, the push to justify the use of these technologies in therapy. So I'm very proud to be working on this project with Dr. Barron and other members at the PMDC. Thank you all. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so I think Mark and Gary have a question for you, Bobby. Yeah, Bobby sure. just received a question that I was asking about you is, I, I exercise regularly as part of my Parkinson's routine. Are there any new pieces of equipment you may recommend to me? That's a good question. So we are exploring a lot of different pieces of equipment for use in Parkinson's disease. Um, it's a, a little bit more challenging for someone at home with equipment because it helps to have the supervision of a trained professional. But I would say, um, Gary, I think you and I have discussed this as well, some at-home virtual reality devices. And I think that leads really well into Alexander's piece. Um, I think it is very interesting seeing these technologies go from a research only application and now becoming commercially available. So meet with your trained professional and determine what types of equipment or pieces would be useful at home and perhaps we can guide you, such as you know, Gary's virtual reality system at home or, or me providing some suggestions for different walking aids. Not quite like this thing, but uh, kind of in that direction. Thank you, Gary. So Dr. Uh, Professor Aboff, we'll switch to you if you're good with that. And you were gonna share with us some of your developments in the vibration therapy and its uh, application to freezing of gait in Parkinson's disease. Thank you, Dr. Berman. Um, hi, many of you know me. I know many of you, but I want to update you on what we're working on for the vibration um, research that we're doing. It's very innovative, um, and I believe we're doing um, quite new things, and we've been just recently um, funded for more research using it as a possible cueing mechanism to help people with op optimizing their gait and balance. So I'm going to share a couple of slides just so you have pictures. The pictures are worth a thousand words. Um, let's see right here. So the study that you all, a lot of you have heard about and helped with, um, was funded by the Michael J. Fox Foundation a couple of years ago. Due to COVID, it's been extended by a year um, just because everything slowed down. Um, so this is optimizing vibration therapy to improve gait and balance. It's a two-part study. In the first study, we're looking at optimizing the dose. When I say dose of vibration, I'm really referring to the frequency, amplitude, how much of this vibration people need to use. Um, and, and that has not been looked at before. Many studies have been done by my team and also others looking at vibration as a benefit. And it, we've all had very positive responses from it, but we don't really know why it helps some people significantly and others not at all. So that's where this study came in. Maybe it is the dose we're giving people. Um, so we just came back with some results on that early results, looking at early stage Parkinson's disease definitely has an optimal dose. We are now actively looking at stage three Parkinson's disease patients that participated and we believe they have their own separate frequency amplitude 
um, that benefits that population of patients. So we're really excited about it because we suspected this to be true and we're coming up with some information that it, it might be. The second part of the study will start soon and we'll look for 24 people with freezing of gait or gait issues because of Parkinson's disease. And we're gonna test what we learned in study one in study two in a randomized controlled trial. Again, this is very novel in that we're pushing the testing of this technology um, further than anyone's tested before. Um, so I'm very excited to see how this works and what information we gain from it. The next study, we were just funded by the NIH, NINDS, National Institute of Neurological Disease and Stroke, um, using the mechanism of smart and connected health and just was awarded $814,000 for a four-year study. This study, we're gonna use vibration there a little bit differently. Um, our first part of the study is to identify freezing of gait prior to its occurrence. So in our observations, and we watch people walk all day long with Parkinson's, is there is a certain steppage that people have before they have that freezing of gait. So we'd like to capture that using sensors. The top right of the screen is this ultra gesture device developed by Dr. Zhu um, in College of William and Mary. We're collaborating with him and have, thankfully to a lot of the donations that have come in for vibration therapy, we were able to use that device and our gate mat at the NOW Center and we're able to identify, we believe we're able to identify that pre-steppage that happens before a freezing of gait. That is very important because we're gonna use that information to trigger a vibration cue. So what I mean by vibration cue is the device on the top, right? Which is very small, is worn around the ankle. It detects the freeze. Um, and here's a diagram of what we presented to the NIH. Um, a plain stop looks very different than a freeze stop. And then we're gonna have that network to the device that we're currently using um, that, that'll trigger a vibration dose. So the three parts of this in the next four years is solidifying that we could identify that freeze a gate just before it happens or at the start of freeze a gate, that'll trigger a tactile response or cue to the patient that's experiencing it. And then we're gonna identify a level of stimulus needed to stop or shorten the freeze of gate episode. And then the most exciting part of this though is gonna, we're gonna test it in the community setting. We realize we could test all we want to in the lab setting, but it doesn't really reflect what helps you, the patients in the community. So that's gonna be, um, I believe very novel and, and the first in the country as well. So, not to ignore any of the lab tests that we're doing, but somehow we have to go beyond the wires and the computers and the Arduino boards and everything that's wrapped around everybody's ankle with wires to tactile, the tactile stimuli on the feet. So I got a very, an internal grant funded by the Fierstein Brezinov Innovations Grant at VCU Langston Center for 15 grand. And that is so that I could collaborate with people um, to develop a device. And in this case, it's a wearable sock, two parts um, that hold, one holds the electronics of the vibration device and the other one is the sock that attach, it attaches to. Um, I learned so much working with this. I work with the department of, in the School of Arts, the Department of Design, Merchandising um, and Marketing. And You'd be surprised how many different knits, stitches, et cetera, exist, even Velcro. Um, and we've um, learned from each other. So two parts of that is developing the actual prototype, which you see on the right side. And that's a hand stitch. That's like duct tape and spit, putting that together, um, which is usual for prototypes. And then integrating the part where the school of nursing and my expertise comes in is we're developing this using human factors research is dr driving the design of this. What that means in simple terms is people that are volunteering that have Parkinson's disease or family members of people, loved ones with Parkinson's disease or therapists that have a specialty in this disease, we're gathering them together, showing them prototypes and asking for feedback. So it's truly driven not by what our team thinks it should be, it's what you all are giving us input for. 
So that is going on right now. It's actually in the manufacturer. We're testing one now and we hope in a couple of days to get a prototype. So I'm looking for volunteers to try it out and give us some feedback. Um, where do we see this going in the future? We see, um, let me stop my share and show. What I'd like to do in the future is, and we've started a little bit of this, is looking at what does the stimulation of vibration do for tremor study? And we did have a pilot study early on for that. And we did see some redu reduction in time of tremor. We also found a very interesting find that there is more than one tremor that people with Parkinson's has. Using the device from William and Mary, we could look at the Hertz, the frequency of the vibration and see the different types of tremors that people actually do have. And I think that's also novel, but that was a pilot study and we have to delve more into that to see. So that's what the state is right now for the vibration research here at VCU. Ingrid, thank you. Yeah. Thanks so much. Um, we had gotten a question submitted last week from one of our listeners today, and I was hoping you can answer it. Um, it's simply, why does vibration therapy work? So the short, uh, and as a scientist, I like to know for sure why things work. I have to say that we really don't know, but I will tell you what we suspect. Um, we believe that we're, it's a sensory cue and that we're activating the mechanoreceptors in the skin that's sending afferent nerve messages back to the central nervous system. So that's what we believe is occurring, um, which is why, and each one of those mechanoreceptors are activated by different hertz and different vibration modes. So that's why it's important to find that sweet spot. It might be related to the uh, stage of disease, we find that sweet spot, or it might be very individualized and we have to figure out which works for which patient. So that's what we believe is happening. Um, but the why question, I'm gonna ask the scientists sitting on the board to help me out with that one. Maybe Brian or Mark can help me out with that one. I would love to figure that out. I think if we figured that piece out, we could really tailor this more specifically to the use, even beyond Parkinson's, MS, multiple sclerosis, other populations of patients, specifically for trauma. I think this, it's, a, it's, it's ripe for looking at. And there's 200 years of, literature saying that vibration helps Parkinson's disease. I just pit bull personality and I'm not gonna let this go until I could figure out more. Right, thank right. you. Yeah, thank you. I, yeah, if I was to answer, it'd be speculation. So I think I'll just uh, say it's a really interesting, innovative work that you're doing, Ingrid. And it's thank uh, you. exciting to see your progress and uh, expanding to the sock feel too. And that's it really interesting. Yeah, I mean, wearables, who knew? I had no yeah. idea how many ways you could build a sock. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Uh, all right, good. So I think we've um, got the slides um, prepared here and we can head back to Dr. Barron to hear a little bit more about the eye tracking diagnostic work that he, he's doing as well as a little bit of background of the Kyogo uh, exoskeleton um, that we saw in action. Uh, Bobby, you ready to go? All right, fabulous. Uh, so we forwarded the slides. I think I ran into some uh, firewall problems here. So uh, we're going to talk about uh, technology, uh, other technology that hopefully works. Uh, we're, we're not having such problems as this uh, firewall issue here. So uh, so uh, it's a pleasure to talk about uh, what I do and uh, share a couple of uh, research uh, endeavors that I've been involved with and very excited about. Uh, first, I'm going to talk about uh, eye tracking. So um, as you can see on this picture, this is uh, actually uh, drawing us a mannequins holding, uh, wearing these uh, eye trackers that can uh, have little cameras uh, that can see where your eyes, your eyes actually are in space. And so if you look up on the uh, picture up in the left top corner, what you see is a very flat line, which represents, uh, these are actual recordings that's from someone who does not have Parkinson's disease. And when they're looking at a target, their eyes are very, very stable. On the other hand, when you look at the person on the right, what you see uh, represented is essentially a tremor of the eyes that's the same as the tremor, same frequency as the tremor you would see in the hand. And, um, this, and I'll discuss why that's critical. So we can move to the next slide. Uh, so 
here's here's one of the problems. The problem here being that uh, diagnosis. Well, uh, patients, people believe or want to believe that whoever they're seeing the physician is able to accurately diagnose them. These are really much harder diagnoses than people realize. And uh, even in the best of hands, uh, these are looking, so these are studies that were done uh, in patients who have died. We all die eventually. Uh, and they've been able to look at their brains and they realize that even in the best of hands, we're talking 85 to 90%, or another way to look at it is 10 to 15% are misdiagnosed, which is really frightening. And that's in best of hands. So if you move your way down to primary physicians, they really, really have a hard time. And a general neurologist who hasn't specially trained in neurology really struggles to get the right diagnosis. So uh, having the right diagnosis is critical for many reasons. So if we could advance. Uh, as we go forward, uh, this is really the ultimate. So you could think of the COVID vaccine, which we're all familiar with. Well, ultimately, we'd like a similar vaccine for Parkinson's disease. Well, whether there'll be a one fits all, that's still unclear. But, uh, but, it, but in the future, there will be these treatments. And so it's critical that you have, it will be, will be then especially critical that the diagnosis is correct and you're getting the right treatment. Uh, because if you're not susceptible to Parkinson's disease, you're you shouldn't, you, you, you're not gonna be getting these treatments. And even now uh, to get, there are patients who have Parkinson's disease or have delayed treatments for years and vice versa being treated for Parkinson's disease when they have another condition. So we can advance. And so why the eyes? Well, the eyes is a muscle just like your arms, your legs, and it's very sensitive. It takes very uh, little to go wrong with eye movements. You need to be able to look at a target. You need to put it on the back. If you look at the bottom target left, uh, you need to put that, that visual target in one little tiny, tiny spot called the fovea. If it's not perfectly on that spot, your vision will be blurred. If you look at the top right picture, there's many muscles and there's many, many brain regions involved. And if everything is not perfect, your eye movements will not be perfect. You will not be able to move perfectly. You will not keep your vision exactly where it's supposed to be on that fovea. And because of that, we wanted to look more at the eyes and see if that's a more sensitive way to maybe look at Parkinson's disease and to diagnose it. So next slide. The next slide you will not be able to run because it's a video, but it actually, if it was working, if I could activate it, you would actually see the eye shaking and that's what we can see only with very, very special equipment. So next slide. And so we wanted to know when these changes in the eyes began, because we know that Parkinson's disease begins ages before you show up in the clinic, ages. And it's disputed as to really how long in advance. We know there's a condition called REM behavior disorder, where you move in your sleep, uh, and so patients with REM behavior disorder have a very high likelihood to go on to get Parkinson's disease on an average 12 years from when they begin their REM behavior disorder. So we took people with very early REM behavior disorder and we said, are their eye movements normal or not normal at this point? And so here's an example of four people. We did DAT scans, which looks at dopamine imaging and we matched them up to the eye findings. One of these is the normal pattern. And when you look at the DAT scan in that person who may be at risk for Parkinson's disease, it was perfectly normal, fitting, fitting with the image. And same with, and then if you look at the other three who are predicted to go on to Parkinson's disease, when we look at their DAT imaging, sure enough, they're already showing DAT changes in, in dopamine imaging. Uh, we've followed many of these people for a very long time already. Uh, a couple of things to notice is this 62 year old man, six years later showed up with the onset of tremor. Uh, indeed, proved to have Parkinson's disease. Notice the age of the guy second from the bottom, the gentleman, 27. So does that mean that no, he's young and will never get it? I would argue, yes, he will, but maybe we're picking up 20 to 30 years that, or maybe he's gonna get it at a younger, much younger age. Um, all right, so next slide. 
And so we've been working uh, a couple of ways now is we need to validate everything we've been doing. We've been working on this for uh, 15 years uh, as a team effort. Uh, we have a grant through the Michael J. Fox Foundation, a very large grant that we're finishing now and we'll be soon analyzing the data. The purpose for that is like all good science is you got to prove it. So we designed a multi-center study with a number of academic centers. And the idea was to take many blind, many patients, keep all the examiners, the investigators, the people analyzing the data all blinded so we can see how accurate the eye tracking really is. Uh, just like the COVID vaccine, we decided not to wait uh, till the answer was there and wanted to move ahead. Uh, just like the uh, Pfizer and Moderna uh, did. And we moved ahead with a company. We've already designed ways for this to be all automated. Uh, we have a piece of equipment that you don't need to wear on the head anymore. It has a little sensor at the bottom of that laptop that can see where your eye movements and get very accurate uh, data. This can be, this is all printed out. And so the physician can get an answer that says, this is going to be Parkinson's disease, this is not Parkinson's disease and can do many other diagnoses. So again, we're in the process of validating it, of validating all this and should have our answers very, very, very soon. Um, so next slide. So I'm gonna move on to uh, assisted technology. So, um, so we know, so this is a couple, uh, well, uh, hopefully two people that, uh, actors that were, uh, they were popular in the 70s, two shows. Uh, first was the uh, $6 million man, and that was followed by uh, the bionic woman. Uh, and what they, what happened to these two is they were in major accidents, their bodies were put back together. They were actually turned into super, superhuman beings. Could this be possible in the future? Uh, hopefully we'll have found ways to cure and slow down these diseases uh, well before that. But in the meantime, can we do something like this without uh, doing what was done in these shows that's more realistic, uh, that's more um, uh, nonfiction rather than these fictional characters. And so next slide. So what we, what we realized is, um, is that there are these exoskeletons out there. So this is high technology. Uh, and so this, uh, one of the first ones to be designed was called the Rewalk. And it was really designed for people that were paralyzed, uh, that had such disability that they could barely walk. So these devices, you strap on the leg. And what's amazing is you can actually see these people walking around the veterans hospital that otherwise would be confined to a wheelchair and are actually walking with these devices. In their case, these devices are really doing most, if not all the work for them. But the amazing thing is it's allowing them to be mobile so we asked the question, which is why can't we put these on people who are as mobile as Parkinson patients are, but give them just a little bit of assistance to make them uh, walk uh, more, if I can use the word normal, um, uh, to walk in a, in, a much, in a much greater fashion. So we uh, did a lot of research on these. There was one particular company called the Kyogo that had a piece of equipment. If you look at it, it has sensors that actually look at the position of the knee. There's sensors at the hip that know the position of the hip. And what it does is it provides a little bit of extra power, up to 30% power. So you're still putting out 70%, but the equipment is giving you that extra 30% with the idea that that might be all you need to walk at a normal pace, to be able to get up and down stairs, to bend down, pick something up and not need help to get back up. And so the technology is there, but it hasn't been used for movement disorders. It's been used for other conditions. Uh, there are already companies getting into this, uh, Samsung. Uh, so if you think about the equipment on the left for someone with Parkinson's, you might think of those as being kind of the flip phones and Samsung being the, the Samsung phone or the iPhone. These are, this is a prototype. So if you look at it, it's much lighter weight, it's much, uh, more attractive to be walking around in. And so for someone who has Parkinson's moving a little slow, they're depending on levodopa, but they're still 20% slow. Why not put this on if you can walk normal, go and exercise normal. And uh, so we got a small grant to start working with these and trying to advance them. 
uh, to design them specifically for the problems that movement disorders has. What's been amazing, what we didn't expect, and Bobby can show, is that uh, you can put these on, train with, with, with someone of Bobby's skills, take it off, and, and still have gained the benefits you have while you're wearing it. So we do envision people going home with these, walking home with these, but also training with these. And uh, we look at it as the, the sky's the limit and we can make uh, tremendous, tremendous uh, interventions uh, that uh, while we're waiting for waiting for the cures, and so last slide, and I'm going to stop there. Thanks so much, Dr. Barron. Um, I was hoping you can answer a really important question submitted by one of our participants. Um, it's about the exoskeleton. It reads, "My symptoms are not that bad at this point. Do you think my insurance would pay for me to have an exoskeleton?" Ah, that is fantastic. So our long-term goal is to establish these as being needed, as, being, as having a dramatic benefit in people's lives such that the insurance companies will pay for them. Part of our goal is that the insurance companies need it is to show people are falling less, going to emergency rooms less. Uh, they might replace your walker. You might not need the walker. You certainly won't need the, the powered wheelchair if you can actually walk. Uh, this can save people, you know, we, we truly believe that this will uh, give people normal lifespans, normal, uh, you know, there's not a great uh, reduction in, in lifespan for people with Parkinson's disease, but there is. And if the reason is they're not mobile, they're not, they're advancing. The DBS can only do so much. It's fantastic. The medicine is fantastic. But with these devices, we really believe that we can keep people mobile and moving and possibly save a lot of money. Uh, which is really not our goal, but it, from an insurance standpoint, it may be. No, we see no reason why these won't be uh, approved, and that's part of our major goal. And not only to get it approved in the for training purposes, uh, which is easier, but to actually go home, and that's where yeah, the, the, the insurance company really comes in, because uh, it will be an expense, uh, but you know, it, it may save money in the long run. Thank you. Oh, thank and you. And it you may delay surgery. Um, People may not even need the yeah. DBS, which is very expensive. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's, it's hard to put a price on getting your independence and mobility back. And so that'll be something to be worked out. But it's great that the technology is moving in a direction where people can get back to walking and be more independent. So our last, uh, our last speaker uh, is going to be Dr. Alexander Stamenovich. And he's going to talk to us about the latest in, in some virtual reality approaches. Thanks, Dr. Uh, it's been fantastic to hear about some of the outside of the box work going on locally to bring technology into diagnosis and rehabilitation in Parkinson's disease. And it's also great to share the stage with our moderators, Gary and Margaret from Power Over Parkinson's, who have been invaluable uh, with providing us with a platform to gauge with all of you out there in the community. And of course, without your valuable input and contributions, our research would be nearly impossible. So thank you for joining and listening into us today. Uh, I'm hoping to give you a little bit of insight into what we do in the VCU's motor control lab, where we take the expertise of our scientists in who understand mechanisms that underpin how our brains coordinate our movements with balance. And then we try to merge that with the clinical knowledge and know-how that our clinician researchers have in order to develop, in order to develop movement-based rehabilitation strategies that take advantage of new and emerging technologies. And for us, new and emerging technologies include developing therapies in virtual reality that are immersive, interactive, and engaging. Uh, and we choose to use virtual reality because it gives us near unlimited control of what you can see and interact with in the visual environment that we create. And so from here, we can then package movements within these fun and interactive games. And more recently, this technology is, is, is advancing so quickly that it's becoming more easily available and more affordable, such that we expect these things to be available at home very, very shortly. So what we try and do is develop fun and engaging game-based therapies that focus on the specific movements that you may be having problems with. 
So rather than being given a sheet of exercises to complete when you go home, what we try and do is we try and integrate these movements into the tasks within the games. So your practice doesn't come by thinking about what repetition you're up to, but it comes simply through enjoying and trying to beat that high score that you made that last time. And I know there might be some of you in the audience there who feel that they don't have that competitive streak, but I can assure you, I've seen it firsthand that even the mildest of individuals get a little competitive when they're in our VR setups. Currently, my particular focus is on creating therapies that improve your ability to control your torso motion because it's such an important feature of being able to maintain your balance and live independently with confidence. And what we do is we achieve this through person-specific movement algorithms that we apply in a number of different virtual gaming styles. And by that, I mean that you can visit space and be orbiting the earth while fixing your spaceship. We can get you building robots. Uh, you can do a spot of fishing or even hark back to the old school days of play and play a game of dodgeball. And all of these are designed with this underlying foundation that your interactions will produce specific movement behaviors that we're trying to, um, that we're trying to get to. Uh, hopefully in the current global climate, you can all agree that having access to such portable tools not only helps allow you to exercise potentially and keep sharp at home, but it can also be used as a great tool for clinicians by providing them with more information between your annual follow-ups. What we hope is that uh, the technology continues to advance, especially in the ability to track movement in the virtual reality systems, and that we can combine these ideas with artificial intelligence and machine learning so that what we can have is, is that we can have the games analyze your gameplay and your movements and adapt to your movement needs in real time within a particular gaming session or across different sessions. This is where we see our ability to contribute to providing a much desired personalized approach to your rehabilitation. The nice thing about virtual reality is, is that it's usually a lot easier to show. So what I would suggest is if you get an opportunity I'd encourage you to head over to the Power Over Parkinson's website because not only have we made a small informational video about our, ther our therapies as part of Parkinson's Awareness Month last year, but their YouTube channel also has a range of other resources for helping you keep active. Uh, you can also keep in touch with us through social media and you can look at to see what kind of projects we're currently recruiting for on our website, which is movr.vcu.edu. And so that's where we're at at the moment within terms of our virtual reality research. Great. Uh, you guys, Gary, you're uh, muted. Gary and Margaret, did you want to have a question that have, have been asked? I was there. Thanks so much for that presentation. And you know how much I share your enthusiasm about VR, many times that we've been together. But the question I come over to us, it's in two parts. Will this replace by FaceTime with the doctor? And the second part is, how do you see such VR therapies working with a visit to my doctor or my PT person? So Gary, I think if the important thing to understand here is, is that we actually see this as a, a tool that clinicians, whether it's be your doctor or your physical therapist can actually leverage to get more information uh, on, a, on a smaller time scale. Uh, so that, you know, you, they might only be able to see you face to face every six months or so, or even if we think about the current climate where there's a lot of telerehabilitation, we're having a lot of video calls where you might be talking with your neurologists and things like that via video, uh, and that there are some things that don't come across as well. Uh, but hopefully something like these systems uh, being in place means that your uh, healthcare provider might be able to, to see and track your progress and understand uh, what's going on in the interim between those two points. So we really see it as an adjunct or a co being complementary uh, tool that uh, clinicians can use. Uh, well, thank you, Alexander. Yeah, you're not get rid of us just yet, sounds like, but uh, it's pretty exciting to see this uh, technology and um, 
whether it also remains to be seen if insurance will help cover virtual reality uh, games, but certainly working that into the, our, uh, our, our uh, ability to treat people will be, will be great, our options. Uh, all right, so now we had some, some questions that we we're gonna get to uh, that have been asked. Um, so one of them uh, here as for uh, Dr. Barron. So there's a question about whether the, or for Bobby too, is the exoskeleton is available now? And if so, how can one access it? Yes, the exoskeleton is available now. Uh, so here at VCU at the NOW building or the Short Pump Pavilion, as we're rebranding it, I believe, uh, we are applying this device as part of our therapy sessions. So you do not have to be enrolled in a research subject or research study to use it, um, but we are actively recruiting and I'll let Dr. Barron speak a little bit about how to be engaged if that's your desire. Yeah, so uh, we would love for you to, uh, uh, anyone who's interested to hopefully sign up for our study because we really need to, uh, as the question was asked earlier is, uh, was about the insurance. So our goal is to, is to prove how valuable that is. So not only are we using it, but other places will use it. And basically we want this, we want everyone to use this because that's how uh, confident we are. Uh, but we also need it to be improved, to be approved by the insurance company. So unless we have the data, much like we're doing with the eye tracking study, unless you have the data, you're not, we're, we're just not gonna see this moving forward fast enough and we're not going to um, get it approved for home use. So. So people enroll in the study would be critical for us, for everybody, for your, for your, for your uh, co-patients, um, co-patients, I think that was the right word, uh, other co for your colleagues, patient colleagues. Um, so, uh, but, but it's up to Bobby how much additional time he has to run it on somebody outside of the study because Bobby's the one who's running all this and it's, it's his time, so. And just to clarify before you move on, Dr. Berman and Dr. Barron, uh, insurance will cover the visits held at this center as part of a skilled therapy session. Um, Dr. Barron specifically referring to insurance covering purchasing the device. So people do not have to pay out of pocket to come train with the device with a therapist. Yeah, the other plug for the study would be that it's free therapy, right? There's no, your, your visits are all free. Um, so you have no copay and it's 10 visits, right? Or more actually. Yeah, so this isn't uh, it isn't something you can buy on Amazon just yet, but uh, it is available now, and um, I do recommend you working with with experts uh, like Bobby and and getting trained in it to, and making sure that it's done safely. You know, which of course we want to make sure all of these things are done safely. And I guess that brings one question for you, Alexander, in terms of the virtual reality. Um, how do you ensure if people have poor balance? I mean, do they do this sitting, and does that have the same benefit? Um, so at the moment, we're in the very early stages in terms of migrating our platforms uh, to understand the needs of the Parkinson's community. And so we have had uh, a success so far with having uh, individuals play. They usually play standing um, uh, because a lot of the, the tasks that we get people to do in order to try and improve that torso motion is a lot to do with uh, interacting with the world around them through uh, reaching to virtual objects. Uh, and so uh, like when I made examples there before, we, we literally do have individuals sort of uh, holding a, a virtual bucket and actually having these fish jump out of, a, out of a, a lake in front of them and having to scoop them out of the air in order to, to catch them through. So um, it can be, it can actually be shifted so that if we, uh, if we found that individuals towards the, the later stages of disease progression, especially if, they, if they're uncomfortable or not confident with their standing capabilities, we can actually um, sort of grade the exercise to something that's more seated. But those are things that um, once we start to get a, a better understanding of uh, the general framework with how our virtual reality therapies are working to, uh, really the sky's the limit when it comes to um, starting to make these more personalized and starting to add more features into the gameplay to accommodate uh, more individuals and their uh, specific needs. Thank you. And I guess I have one more question that in the 
in the theme of keeping our patients active, uh, this one's for you, Ingrid. Is it possible to exercise with those um, vibration devices on? I mean, can they do physical exercise with them? Oh, you're muted. Okay. I'm oh, sorry, I was muted. You can use the vibration devices in exercise. I have not studied that. Um, I believe, especially when we hit the sock in order and back, that that would be a lot easier for people. Um, we're studying the in the Michael J. Fox study, we are exercising people in terms of they are walking with the device on. Um, and our second study will be looking at the difference of walking with the device on, the vibration turned on versus walking without the vibration and see what kind of difference there is made. That's our randomized controlled trial. So I'll be better able to answer that, Brian, after the next year. Excellent. All right. And there's been a couple of questions that are coming in about um, volunteering to be part of some of these research studies that are going on. And there's going to be some information that uh, that's, had, that's sent out with the the link to today's webinar. So uh, there'll be information coming out to you about how to how to do that. Um, did have a another question that came in um, that is about COVID, which is very relevant to uh, today in our virtual webinar, uh, but asking about Parkinson's patients and their increased risk to COVID and um, the importance of, of safety measures. And um, you know, I would say Parkinson's just like anyone uh, are at no different risk, but there is a high risk. And um, certainly there's potential that if you have a Parkinson's that uh, you may have more uh, severe symptoms if you were to um, be infected. So certainly you want to um, you know, practice the safety measures that are recommended, social distancing, wearing a mask, washing your hands frequently. And, um, and the, the, all the data that's out there at this point says that it's very, um, safe uh, and recommended for Parkinson's patients to get vaccinated, uh, but I also don't know your personal history. So this is something that you really have to discuss with your own um, personal neurologist or physician, primary care physician, whether it's the right uh, for you. All right, let's see. We have time for one more question. Yep, okay. So uh, another question this is for you again, Ingrid. It says, has it been determined if standing on a vibration plate can improve balance. Yes, people have done studies prior to my work that they put people on that vibration plate and they do receive benefit from that in both balance and gait. So like I said, there's a lot of research feasibility and pilot research done before hours started um, and absolutely benefit. Okay, great. All right, well, um, this has been very interesting, very informative. I've loved hearing about all the, the innovative technologies that are being applied to help treat um, Parkinson's patients. Uh, but before we go, I just wanna um, put out an announcement there for our next webinar, which is gonna be scheduled on, uh, for March 26th. And we're gonna focus on the management of motor symptoms in Parkinson's. And uh, this is gonna be an overview of, of advances in the different therapies um, and be discussing pharmacological um, as well as non-pharmacological uh, treatments. And uh, so I do hope you join us for that. There'll be a uh, registration link that'll be sent out to you. And um, again, just a big thank you to all of our uh, attendees out there for um, being engaged with the, the uh, Power for Parkinson's and the VCU Parkinson's Movement Disorder Center. We hope you enjoy this uh, webinar and I hope you consider um, supporting the important research uh, that you heard about today and the technologies. It takes a lot of work, a lot of teams uh, doing this and a lot of time as you've heard. And uh, you can do that uh, and learn more about VCU Health is doing by visiting our website, which is uh, at www.parkinsons.vcu.edu. And a special thank you to uh, Gary and Margaret and Power Over Parkinson's for joining us and um, being part of this webinar. Gary and Margaret, where, where can we find you? Sure. Um, for those of you who don't know our website, it's uh, poweroverpd.org. Um, we're also on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at, at poweroverpd. Um, I believe that's also in the chat box if you want to reference it. 
Um, again, as a final reminder, this webinar is being recorded and it will be sent to you in the coming days. And we thank everyone in the community for participating. Absolutely. Okay, again, uh, thank you. And thank you to our panelists. Thank you to our attendees. And uh, take care, be safe. Uh, until next webinar. Bye-bye.